Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now one man's trash is sometimes another man's treasure. So when I found this beefy looking graphics card discarded by a bunch of old worn out CRT monitors at the local recycling centre, I was pretty excited. After asking permission from the staff they said I could have it and it would turn out to be the first of two of these cards I found in the last couple of months. Though the second more recent find I had to pay £10 for. I was actually holding off testing this dump find card until I could locate a second matching model for SLI purposes but when I finally managed to track one down this weekend it turned out that it didn't quite function as it should crashing after installing the drivers. At that point I thought we may as well just fire this one up on its own because up until this morning it still remained untested. So what is it? Well, it appears to be a Zotac GTX 285 Amp Edition. When it launched in January 2009, it was the fastest single GPU you could buy, and at $380 or £315, it sat quite reasonably priced among a market that seemed to be focusing on dual GPU solutions, though we know that didn't last. While the reference version of the card featured a 648MHz core clock and 1242MHz memory clock, this amplified version featured speeds of 702 and 1296MHz respectively. The most sensible thing to do I felt before anything else was to see if it worked and to do that I stuck it in the Ryzen 5 1600 system and ran Crisis. It made perfect sense that this should be the first thing to try. After all, in early 2009, when this card released, Crisis would have still been a go-to title for benchmarking and review sites everywhere. Playing it on this card really hit me with a wave of nostalgia, and I could just picture 14-year-old me sitting there trying to run it on what I can guarantee you was much weaker hardware than this. It was such a realistic depiction of my past, in fact, that Crisis even crashed my system and sent a no-signal message to my monitor. Ah, the memories. It was then clear as to why this thing was thrown out in the first place, but I bet it just needed a bit of a clean. To do that, I needed to take it outside, but there was a bit of a problem. You're in the studio, Dave. As with all graphics cards, opening them up is a very simple process, but one that can make a lot of difference to temperature and performance. You may remember a couple of videos ago how dust stopped my newly acquired, decade-old PC from even turning on. And while the effects on a graphics card might not be the same, high temperatures in-game can lead to a system crash or shutdown, as you saw in Crisis earlier on. With all the screws removed, it was time to get the heatsink off and apply some new thermal compound. The GT200B chip on this card is pretty big, so it will take a little more than a P in this case. For good measure, I also cleaned the fan out with a can of compressed air, which managed to expel a few clumps of dust. With the card back together, I wanted to see if we could overclock it any further before jumping into some games, as I'd come across a couple of older reviews, whereby the reviewer had bumped the speeds up even further. This was as high as I could get it, but it wasn't to last, and when I started playing Grand Theft Auto V, the system crashed again. This time, at least, I knew that was the result of an unstable overclock, so I lowered things back down to their original yet factory tweaked speeds and tried again. Because of the age of this card, it was inevitable that we'd see a lot of this, this, and some more of this. Despite how cool it looks, it's limited software-wise to Microsoft's DirectX 10 API, so it can't run many new games. With that in mind, it was time to focus on what it could do. For today's video, I decided to target 60 frames per second, lowering the in-game settings to try and hit 60 FPS as often as I could. And considering I was starting with Fortnite, I thought this may be a bit more difficult than I had initially anticipated. To my surprise though, the game actually averaged 60 frames per second with the lowest settings and a 1280x720 3D resolution scaling setting as well. 
although you could probably turn things up a little bit if 30 frames per second is better for you, I found these settings generally work best anyway because there will still be some moments of slowdown as you approach say a built up area or look over a built up area from a distance. When you get to said area though the frame rate will stabilise and hover around 60 to 70 fps. I would think the drops are due to the 1GB of VRAM, which is of course DDR3 as well, which is much slower than modern GDDR5 memory. I then decided to play a little bit more of the original Call of Duty Black Ops, a game that I've recently got back into and one of my favourite in the series. Both single and multiplayer yield a similar result, and during the opening single player level here we saw an average of 60 frames per second once again, despite what looks like a very stuttery experience. I had some recording issues here so the frame rate was impacted a little bit, but when you're actually playing this game it will stick pretty solidly to a smooth 60 frames per second at 1080p, with the high preset and anti-aliasing turned off. Bioshock Infinite at 1080p medium averaged 62 frames per second throughout two different campaign levels. The performance of this title can differ depending on where you are in the game, but it seems to be a pretty solid performance throughout. The frame rate difference between medium and high settings is quite significant with this card it would seem, though there is no real difference with how the game actually looks between the two configurations, so there was no point in turning things up beyond this preset in my opinion. 2013's Outlast also ran at a solid 60fps. I'm certain I disabled VSync so I'm not sure if the game is capped to 60 or if it just wouldn't really budge beyond that point. This frame rate remains stable both throughout the opening outside intro and when you're inside the building too. So if you're looking for a pretty tense and scary horror survival game and have a once top of the range DX10 GPU like this one, rest assured you'll be able to play this and most likely the sequel to this with pretty decent settings. The game was also running on the high preset here with nothing else but the gamma changed, so low or medium would eliminate some of those infrequent frame drops. In Skyrim we turned things up to high and threw in a few ultra options as well. This is the original version of the game, not the recent remaster, as I wanted to be sure I could show you what the best Skyrim experience on a card like this looked like. It's a pretty big map so expect performance changes depending on where you are, but 56 frames per second was the average over my one hour playtime that consisted of just walking around, attacking guards, running from guards and generally being a nuisance to most of the in-game NPCs roaming the world. Looks like I'll be starting what's probably my 900th playthrough of this game very soon. Finally in Grand Theft Auto 5 I had to turn things down to 900p with the normal settings in order to maintain a close to 60fps experience. It's a few years old now this game but that means it continues to be playable on a wide range of hardware that supports DirectX 10, 10.1 and DirectX 11. If you're happy with a closer to 30 frames per second experience then you could probably turn things up to high, though I'd recommend leaving anti-aliasing and any of the advanced options turned off in the graphics menu, as well as turning the resolution up first before adjusting the rest of the options. So in this new little segment I want to talk about any behind the scenes issues I had that may not necessarily apply to every used GTX 285 out there, but things you might want to be aware of nonetheless. One thing I noticed was the loud whining sound that emitted from it during high load scenarios. This didn't occur in every game, but Crisis literally made this thing scream. It sounded in pain, and judging by the earlier crash, it may very well have been. The other problem I found was that CSGO crashed under every test situation. After launching the game in Steam, I would just get a black screen, and then I'd have to press Ctrl Delete before signing out of the system and signing back in again to resolve things. Aside from that, I encountered no other serious problems, except the more recent card that I bought crashing when the drivers were installed, though that's probably just a sign of an absolutely knackered piece of hardware that's been running in a PC for nearly 10 years constantly, rather than an issue that might be commonly experienced. With that said, I encountered no other problems with this card and it worked as it should 
throughout my gameplay tests today. Remember though, a card like this isn't only limited by DirectX 10, but also it's 1GB of DDR3 VRAM. While I'm glad to see some modern titles like Fortnite and GTA 5 still running fine, this card is far past its glory days, though it's still pretty exciting to use when you consider what it once was. And I'm sure that a lot of you older tech enthusiasts would agree as well. That being said, that's all for today's video, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like on it down below, leave a dislike if you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.